You're very, you're very welcome. We're going to talk to us about the heart of the matter. The story of transplant, which has some lessons for us all, I think. Um, well, when Ronan invited me to give uh, grand rounds, um, I uh, thought about it and I, I felt that uh, talking about um, regulation uh, wouldn't be a good thing. Uh, but I also feel that knowing the past makes you understand the present and foresee the future. Uh, and for that reason, I felt that I also feel it's important to uh, have corporate memory, um, especially in a medical institution, and that the uh, young staff know uh, how things have developed, because it does tell you the state of um, uh, what's provided by the state, and it also tells you the behaviours uh, of the Department of Health, which um, uh, doesn't surprise me in relation to the spinal cord injuries. Uh, this type of behavior uh, is consistent throughout the last 50 years or more uh, with the uh, civil service and the public provision for, for health care. Um, I'm sure you're aware uh, only too well that since 1990 there has in effect been a 30% decrease in acute hospital beds in the state. Uh, and in spite of that, surgical output uh, has increased. <coughs> That fact is kept quite silent by a lot of people. I thought since it's Christmas and the last day, I thought I'd show you what the hospital looked like. Um, I think it was uh, six, seven years ago during the bad winter of uh, 2009, 2010. It's a real Christmas card uh, poster and I don't know if Florence has produced Christmas cards from it. Uh, at any rate, to go back uh, 31 years ago, uh, in September the 10th, 1985, the first heart transplant was performed uh, by Morris, uh, the late Morris Nelligan and myself. And I thought it'd be interesting just to uh, tell you uh, why that came about, how it came about uh, and so on. Well, heart transplantation, as you know, uh, was first performed by Christian Bernard in December 1967 in Grote Hospital uh, on a 54 year old man. The donor was a, a, a girl or a lady uh, in her 20s uh, who'd suffered a bad brain injury uh, and head injury. At that time, as you're probably aware, there were no criteria uh, for a death due to a bad brain injury. Worldwide, the diagnosis of death was the last heartbeat. And it's interesting reading the recounts now of Christian Bernard. He spoke to the donor family, advised them that um, their daughter would not survive. And then with his brother, he brought the donor into a conjoining operating room and uh, gave um, a high dose of uh, potassium uh, intravascularly to arrest the heart. When the heart was arrested, they explored the groin, put the patient on bypass, resuscitated the heart, uh, and at the same time, the recipient operation was being performed uh, in the other room. Now, I was fortunate a, a year later as a third year medical school in St. Vincent's Hospital. While I'm an alumnus of the Matter Hospital, I was a student and young register in Vincent's Hospital. Um, but uh, as a third year resident student, I had the good uh, fortune to uh, hear Christian Bernard uh, speak uh, to the consultant and uh, medical staff in Vincent's. And this is a picture of him uh, in the College of Surgeons with Keith Shaw and Ona Malley uh, on his right hand side, both future presidents uh, of the college. And on his extreme left is Dr. John O'Connell, who went on to be um, Minister of Health and was indeed Minister of Health at the time that Morris and I performed uh, the first uh, heart transplant. In heart transplantation and lung transplantation, it's important to understand that Norman Shumway in Stanford led the development of both orthotopic uh, heart uh, transplantation, but also um, uh, lung transplantation. And he uh, ran a very uh, sophisticated, demanding animal laboratory in Stanford from 1959. He first started in dogs uh, and then proceeded to uh, primates, uh, uh, chimpanzees, and was able to get a survivorship uh, of up to a year in chimpanzees. And he developed the whole technique uh, of um, heart transplantation. Christian Bernard learned this technique from Norman Shumway's research um, fellow, who was then in practice in Richmond, uh, Virginia uh, in 1963. And he returned then to South Africa to, uh, as I've said, perform the first transplant. Uh, 
the first transplant survived 19 days and shortly uh, in the new year in 1968 he performed the second one within two years transplant heart transplantation had fall, fallen into gross disrepute because few if any patients survived beyond a year in fact the mortality at three months from post transplantation was something like 80 percent the other issue was uh, the great debate that began to be raged is how to diagnose death due to irreversible brain injury but norman shumway's group persisted uh, in um, developing uh, uh, orthotopic uh, transplantation and as you can see here all of transplantation has been intimately connected with basic research importantly um, Shumway's group in 1972 developed a, a technique of a, a bioptone, and this was developed by Philip Caves, the Belfast heart surgeon, uh, and it allowed the accurate diagnosis of rejection and then the categorization of uh, histological rejection. But importantly, Roy Kahn in, in, in Cambridge in 1977 uh, 78 reported the use of cyclosporin. Uh, in both liver transplantation and uh, kidney transplantation with a significant improvement in results. Shumway took this to use it in his heart transplant population and in 1982 reported its use over three years. It had dramatic effects on the success of heart transplantation with the result that 85% of patients being transplanted survived uh, a year. The other important uh, issue was that uh, an isolation uh, room stay of three week, of three months was reduced down to seven days. Thus, he had made heart transplantation uh, possible to be re reconsidered by many centers around the world. At the same time, um, the debate about uh, brain death uh, had raged, and in 1979, uh, the Academy of Royal Medical Colleges in the UK finally came out with criteria, clinical criteria, to diagnose. Initially, they called it brain death and later revised it to brain, brain stem death. You should know that these criteria are only recognized by a small number of countries in the world. Uh, recently, in 2008, the US President's um, Council uh, on uh, bioethics did not accept them and the demand for diagnosing brain death in, in uh, the US uh, is even greater. The indications for heart transplantation are really terminal heart failure. How this arose was that in uh, 1984, Brian Moore, the late Brian Moore, the cardiologist in Vincent's approached Morris and myself with a 24 year old young man dying from a terminal heart failure uh, as a consequence of a congenital cardiomyopathy on whether we consider, could consider it. And this was on foot of um, Shumway's uh, paper published in 82. At the time in 1984, there was Morris and myself, uh, Owen O'Malley and Keith Shaw. We were the only cardiac uh, uh, surgeons in Ireland, uh, all based in the Matter Hospital. And in 1984, uh, we were on target to do a thousand open heart cases uh, and thus become the uh, second uh, or equal first uh, largest open heart unit in the British Isles. We were quite confident that the expertise was, uh, was uh, available both surgically uh, uh, and uh, uh, otherwise, uh, but we had to speak to uh, Professor Bofin, the city coroner, uh, to uh, get his views on whether he would accept heart transplantation, uh, but equally to accept um, the criteria for, for brain death, uh, even though they were currently being used by the renal transplant group. Uh, fortunately, Paddy Bofin uh, was very supportive of developing a transplant program, as indeed were the transplant surgeons, uh, Dennis Murphy and the late Sean Hansen. We spoke to the guards uh, and the Air Corps uh, because uh, we were going to have to uh, go for donors uh, around the island of Ireland, uh, really, if we were to have a chance uh, of having a successful program. Um, we got support from the sur then, then surgical division and the sisters of the hospital were extremely supportive. We mentioned it to the Department of Health and they requested a feasibility uh, uh, study but uh, at the time, uh, events uh, moved much faster than being able to produce a feasibility study. And there were knock-on consequences uh, of that later on. 
from a specific medical point of view, well, uh, Morris and I were also performing very complex uh, congenital heart surgery at the time when we were each doing about 300 to 350 open heart cases a day or a year. Uh, anesthesia, John Magner, Dennis Moriarty and uh, Roshan McSullivan uh, uh, agreed to be very active in the development. But importantly, on site, we already had Peter Darwin, who later became the professor of pathology, during his time in Boston, uh, he had uh, learned the skill of interpreting uh, endomyocardial biopsies and already was able to, or skilled in diagnosing rejection. Rosemary Hohn, the microbiologist at the time, was equally supportive and she'd had uh, personal experience of uh, supporting a renal transplant program. The laboratory scientists, uh, Frank Kine and Sean McGuire, developed uh, uh, and proposed our uh, assay technique for um, cyclosporin. And as listed there, Sister Jared in the operating room and Sister uh, uh, Attracta in the intensive care uh, were extremely supportive. Our, co our coordination of all of this from a logistic point of view was going to be by our sole secretary to the unit, who was Betty McCluskey. Uh, the physical item that we had to provide for were isolation rooms. The hospital did not have any isolation rooms at the time. It had two intensive cares, a six-bedded general intensive care and a nine-bedded uh, cardiac uh, thoracic intensive care. Because of funding, uh, Morris, uh, in his inimical way, started to fundraise. So there was a, this massive um, black and white um, ball in the Burlington Hotel in November 1984. There was something like a thousand people, uh, mainly from South County Dublin at it, but it raised £50,000, the equivalent of half a million euros uh, today. It allowed the isolation rooms to be built. Uh, we lost one. Uh, bed space in the intensive care, but importantly allowed nurses to be sent over to Harefield uh, from a theatre point of view, an intensive care point of view, uh, in relays uh, to uh, convince them that they had the skill and competence to look after transplantation. From a donor point of view, uh, the donor uh, criteria were very uh, uh, um, standard uh, at the time, uh, but you do have to in heart donation, you do need a, a heart the size of the recipient that you're putting in it to. Uh, and it needs to be ideally, if it's male to male or female to female rather than female to male. Uh, for equivalent sizes, uh, female hearts are 10% smaller than male hearts. So if, if you take a man and a woman of the same body size, uh, body surface area, then her heart will not be sufficient uh, for, for the man in, in transplantation, and this has to be taken into consideration. We had to try and keep the total ischemic time uh, down to ideally less than three hours. That includes the time taking it out, packing it, uh, transporting it uh, from the donor site, and the implantation time. When you put it all together, it meant that our tr maximum travel time was going to be an hour to an hour, uh, an hour and a quarter. I put four hours there. At the time in 85, if a uh, heart was ischemic for four hours, the chance of it failing and the patient dying was greater than 50%. On the particular day in question, on the 10th of September, uh, 82, it was uh, an Indian summer day. Uh, we got a call from the late Johnny O'Sullivan uh, and the late Bosco Mahoney in Wexford General Hospital to say that they had um, a brain damaged a young man in the 20s following a road traffic accident and they considered him an ideal donor. They'd already diagnosed him as brain dead. Would we consider using the heart? And fortunately, um, the young man uh, was a, a blood group O and we had two patients waiting at the time. One of them, uh, a 34 year old uh, laborer from Carlingford uh, who'd suffered a massive MI and had, had uh, survived uh, four months previously and was in hospital in the matter in a poorly controlled heart failure. Uh, and he'd already agreed to transplantation, uh, knowing that it was the first, he, he was likely to be the first transplant in Ireland. Uh, fortunately, uh, the blood match and size match was uh, appropriate. Uh, so Roshan McSullivan and I, with the renal team, flew off from Baldonnell uh, in uh, one of these uh, Air Corps uh, helicopters to uh, Wexford. On reaching Wexford, uh, to our chagrin, uh, Wexford was covered in a complete sea mist and there was no chance of uh, landing at the hospital. 
Uh, and it looked as if the whole thing was going to be aborted. Uh, the pilot, I was sitting beside the pilot and connected to him by the uh, uh, RT system. And he spoke to me and said, well, listen, uh, we'll try and fly up and find Bunclody uh, and the Slaney River. And we'll fly down uh, the Slaney to uh, Wexford. And he said at the same time, if we don't get in this time, then I won't have enough fuel to get back uh, to Baldonnell. So he found the Slaney and we flew down the Slaney at about 100 feet, which was quite interesting in itself. And fortunately, on arriving in Waterford, while the, uh, the sea mist was still there, he was able to identify the hospital. These alouettes, the only navigation instruments that they had were a simple, a simple compass and there was no radio beacon or homing device. Uh, so it was a bit fly by the pants. The other thing is they're single engined and if the engine failed, uh, then um, we were all in serious trouble especially if it happened at, at 100 feet. We would not have survived. Uh, at any rate, the donor heart proved suitable. Uh, Roisin and McSullivan um, uh, scrubbed in with me, uh, helped me harvest the heart, and we flew back to, to Dublin. This is the scene I met uh, as I came into Theatre 5. Uh, here's Owen O'Malley scratching the back of his head. I've called it contemplation. He's a bit like Rodin's thinker. Uh, and this is the actual scene. There were 33 other people uh, in the operating room. Uh, the white, uh, white head you see there uh, was our senior register, uh, whom Jerry knows well who went on to be the first lady president of a college of surgeons uh, in, in uh, these islands, Professor Eilish McGovern. Um, we were overseen in the implant, implantation by the two pioneers of heart surgery in Ireland, uh, Owen O'Malley uh, here, as common he always was catching the seat of his pants, uh, and uh, Keith Shaw. Uh, the patient, Eddie Kelly, uh, we discharged 16 uh, days later. The whole episode was um, minutely uh, reported. This is on the day after surgery and the amount of detail that Dr. David Nolan had, you would wonder where he got it from. Um, I know well where he got it from, but it, it describes in, uh, every detail of the whole operation. and even uh, tells us that um, the implantation time took uh, 55 minutes. I can tell you the source wasn't myself, but uh, it was my colleague. So over the subsequent years, uh, from 85 to 2004, the activity varied from uh, 3 to 4 per annum uh, to a peak in 1990 uh, of 20. Uh, at that stage, it became obvious that we're going to need additional resources and support. We approached the Department of Health at that time uh, to look for um, a coordinator and some uh, other resources. And we were very quickly told, because we didn't get permission in the first place, sorry. Um, that's it, no funding. So the heart transplant program was never actually formally funded and is even, it's not funded to this day. They did equate each transplant uh, to two and a half times the cost of um, a coronary artery bypass graft operation. Uh, so that's all the hospital got uh, for uh, doing the performing the transplant program. In 1991, I was four hours away uh, from doing a single lung transplantation. And because of the previous um, uh, discussion with the Department of Health, Morris and I uh, decided to talk to, inform me to an official of the department to see if they would uh, agree to us going ahead. And the answer was no. So we didn't go ahead with lung transplantation in 1991. <laughs> um, and I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. We reported the first 20 years of transplantation in 2006. And as you see, even though Morris had retired, I felt it quite appropriate uh, from a professional point of view that Morris was uh, on the uh, on the published uh, paper. And at that stage, we reported heart transplantation uh, in 228 patients. We had performed 229 transplants. You may well wonder why it's uh, 229 and that's because uh, one of the patients in 1992 uh, at this stage Morris and I had decided to separate um, doing the running the uh, whole uh, particular operation up to mid-1991 we'd each scrub I'd harvested everything and then we scrubbed in uh, together for the recipient operation and managed everything together immediately post-operatively 
operatively, but by, in 1991, we were both extremely busy doing about uh, 600, 650 open hearts a, a year between the Mater, Crumlin and, and other hospitals, and we just couldn't continue in that fashion, so we de decided to separate it. But inevitably, as you, as um, uh, happened throughout my career with Morris, I would get a phone call at three o'clock in the morning to say, Freddie, we're in deep shit. <clears throat> and here as I was trying to wake up at home and I couldn't understand why I should be, I should be in trouble. Anyway, he went on to relate, he's just finishing the transplant and the national coordinator had called him to say that the lab report uh, from the hematology blood bank had just uh, come back. Uh, the laboratory report uh, now stated that uh, the um, donor heart uh, was A positive. When in the uh, notes recorded, we had understood it to be an O positive, and in the hospital notes, it was recorded as an O positive. So here we were, we'd Im implanted the wrong blood group uh, 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 into the patient, and in heart transplantation, Blood group matching is important. Uh, if you don't match them, you get a, a hyperacute rejection. So uh, I came into the hospital. Uh, the patient was al already beginning to deteriorate. Morris had already rung Magdia Kub for advice. Uh, the advice was um, send blood specimens over and plasma freeze, freeze them every six hours, which gave us trouble. Uh, at any rate, what we decided to do was re to retransplant them. Uh, uh, and fortunately, um, the National Donor Coordination Group uh, were able to provide us with a new heart within 12 hours. So the patient end, uh, ended up waking up after his second heart transplant. He is still alive today, interestingly enough. The other interesting thing was I was contacted five days later by the media to uh, be asked that uh, to explain why we'd put in the wrong heart. And um, I hedged my bets, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, six months previously, uh, a young uh, mother uh, had died uh, on the August weekend from hyperacute rejection. And I said, well, listen, uh, what happened was this patient was suffering hyperacute rejection and fortunately we were um, offered another heart so we were able to retransplant him. I said we had learned from the last episode nine months ago and he hummed and hawed and everything else and I said well listen uh, that that's the way it is uh, you've been very good to us in supporting this program the patient is doing very well so a small headline appeared in the paper next day uh, just to say um, I think he was a Kildare man. Kildare man uh, is doing well after two heart transplants. Uh, but uh, at any rate, importantly, uh, just uh, on this paper, our uh, one year uh, uh, survival was 84% and our five year survival was 76%. And when we compared it to the uh, international literature at the time, see, we're comparing very well. Now, where, where it says there uh, 15 years uh, internationally, we actually got, we're getting. Uh, 50% of our population to survive uh, 14 years. I should explain that all the post-transplant care from, for discharge from hospital, from a medical point of view, I was providing uh, with the surgical staff. Uh, we'd know it, uh, no uh, medical staff involved. Uh, Shumway visited in 1994. Uh, I used to have an annual lecture and I invited him over. And in the same year, um, he uh, was awarded an honorary fellowship by our college. And he is, was a really charming, uh, charming individual. Uh, you can see the, the Morris and myself and David Luke uh, there. From a transplant point of view, uh, this uh, is a group of survivors taken in 1992 uh, from the first tranche. The man circled was the sixth transplant. Uh, and while I said earlier that they need uh, social stability and social support, he was in fact an orphan. Uh, he was 19. Uh, he'd been in remand school. Uh, and he is currently alive today. Uh, 30, uh, 30 years and six months out from his transplant. Um, from the immunosuppression, uh, he developed a solid organ cancer uh, at year 17, uh, hypernephroma, and the late John Fitzpatrick removed it. Uh, and uh, naturally, because of a single kidney and the effect of the immunosuppression, he went into progressive renal failure and became dialysis dependent. And we put him up then for kidney transplantation. I performed the workup 
uh, for kidney transplantation. And uh, as is uh, usual, um, you do a full uh, virology screen. And to our chagrin, uh, he came back as hepatitis C positive. He'd only had two units of blood in all his uh, admissions uh, to hospital. And those two units of blood were given by Morris and myself in uh, 1986 for his transplant operation. And as you know, uh, in 1988-89, there was the hepatitis C crisis. He, fortunately, David Hickey took him on and he was transplanted with a kidney. And as I say, he's still alive today. He walks from Artane into the centre of Dublin every day and back home again. Indeed, all our heart transplantation uh, group, uh, even if they weren't working beforehand, all got back to work. Uh, and of the group uh, I showed you there, Two others are at 28 years, uh, 29 years, and uh, 28 years. From a lung transplant point of view, what happened was that in 1997, a cystic fibrosis patient awaiting transplantation in London died. He was a patient of Mary Fitzgerald's. There was a public outcry about it. And Brian Cowan, the then Minister of Health, fortunately decided to set up a heart-lung trans uh, transplant program. And whether this was advice from uh, his senior civil servants or not to add the title heart onto heart-lung, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but it allowed me, uh, when um, I was asked to um, put the whole program in place and lead it, it allowed me to address issues uh, in relation to staffing and, and facility for the heart program uh, as well as for the lung program. Uh, very simply, in the lung program, we visited the four main hospitals uh, in, in Britain, Herfield, uh, Papworth, uh, Manchester, and uh, the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle. We then had a tendering process uh, for uh, the initial performance of the surgery, and we set up a coordination referral unit in the matter, uh, then going on to an assessment unit uh, and a ward area to take tr uh, transplants back. And we finally proceeded to um, a lung transplantation in May of 2005. Putting all this uh, additional facility in place in the proposal, because I, of my understanding with the Department of Health, I also wrote proposals to set up an ECMO program uh, in uh, the matter and in Crumlin, and an artificial heart program, uh, which they uh, agreed in accepting the whole pro uh, proposal in relation to heart-lung transplantation. And on foot of that, it allowed a uh, mechanical heart program to develop also in May 2005 uh, and uh, the ECMO program that you now will see in intensive care, both in the matter uh, and in Crumlin. Um, and it ensured that they would be funded to some extent um, uh, by, by the state. Otherwise, they wouldn't have provided any funding. I put this slide up uh, to talk about uh, bronchiolitis obliterans. It's the main problem in lung transplantation. It was actually first described in the world by Professor Connor Burke from Blanchestown on the Matter in 1984, whilst he was a respiratory fellow uh, in Shumway's unit in Stanford. So there's been a, a significant association and interlinking between us here and Stanford, and also uh, uh, with Papert uh, uh, in uh, England. I should have said that uh, six months before starting here, I decamped to Terence, Sir Terence English's group uh, in uh, Papworth for a week to uh, see how they organize things and also to learn how to do the endomyocardial biopsy through an internal jugular cannulation. And for the first four years of the program, I used to perform the uh, endomyocardial biopsies in theater one, uh, usually on the thoracic list, um, to um, assess uh, how well they were doing. By the time I retired in 2010, 28 transplants had been performed with 100% survival. One had died uh, a, a year after surgery, but the uh, lung transplant program was very successful. In the proposal, it was estimated that there would be a need of 30 to 35 lung transplants a year, and whether it would reach that would purely depend on uh, the donations uh, that were available. From an international point of view, uh, the top line in blue is the uh, initial Irish program. We compared very well uh, with the international results. As I mentioned, uh, mechanical heart uh, program uh, uh, was um, 
approved and this is the first uh, implantable left heart system that we put in in 2007. This is a 33 year old woman uh, with um, untreatable heart failure with uh, gross panel antibodies and she was untransplantable. Uh, she was a single mother with three uh, children uh, from South Dublin and she eventually agreed uh, as she was dying to be the first case for, for a mechanical heart implantation. She did very well uh, up to last year. Uh, she died uh, some, or this year, she died sometime this year from infection, but it's been very successful. Uh, the future is uh, donor optimization and organ preservation. <coughs> we were close to using this device. Uh, this is a heart preservation device. It does create ethical issues, but uh, we didn't proceed with it because the cost of this unit here was going to be a quarter of a million euros, and then the disposables were going to be 35,000 uh, euros uh, per, per, uh, per organ. Um, when um, it's now fallen out of disuse because of costs, the American company would not reduce their costs. Uh, so while it's initially proved uh, effective in, in maintaining hearts for a longer time, it didn't show any effect in resuscitating hearts to make unusable hearts usable. Usable. Um, lastly, I just briefly put up uh, the recommendations of the um, NHS uh, Organ Donor Task Force uh, because um, the um, Human Tissue Act uh, in relation to organ transplantation and other use of human parts uh, is back on the table again. It's been in draft form since 2008, but it is hoped that it may be before the Houses of the Eructus uh, within two years. Uh, what, ha what else happened as well within um, uh, six months to nine months of the first program, uh, Morris and I were formally censured by the Medical Council um, and it was made public uh, at the time. Uh, it, we hired a senior counsel, Hugh Flaherty, and it took him nine months to discover that the Medical Council at that time had broken its rules. They had failed to notify us of the complaint, uh, but they had rushed to uh, publicly censure us. Uh, because of or on the grounds of uh, advertising. I opened the file uh, about uh, oh, four, four months ago, given the position I'm in, it's 30 years out, to discover that the complaint was initially made by a GP in North Wicklow uh, on the grounds of uh, advertising. Um, but I was already being monitored by the uh, register or CEO, the Medical Council, in that there was uh, recordings of um, radio interviews uh, uh, I, I had given. Uh, this was brought before uh, the fitness to practice and whole medical council itself. And as I say, they rushed uh, to censure us. It's, been, it's proved very useful in the position I, I, I'm, I'm in. Uh, it's kept um, a degree of control over some of the council members in that they understand that I've been on the receiving end as well. In Christmas, uh, 1983, Eamon Sweeney, the, uh, the pathologist in um, St. James's, did this cartoon for the Irish Medical Times. And it's just relevant. Th these are all white elephants at the top. So you'll see PMPA, Tara, Beulah Mines, uh, uh, the Dart, and other things. This is the Minister Barry, he uh, Barry Desmond doing his best to be the puppet, puppet master and control myself and Morris, but also the liver transplant surgeons. Uh, O'Higgins and Guiney. In 1986, liver transplantation was attempted in the matter of Vincent's uh, and Crumlin uh, unsuccessfully. What many don't know is each of the hospitals were fined uh, the equivalent, were, were, they were fined, fined a quarter of a million uh, pounds uh, per case uh, at the time uh, for, for their failure. Subsequently, of course, in 1991, um, funding uh, was made available by, by the state to set up a very successful liver program uh, in, in St. Vincent's Hospital, which Jerry was an essential part to making uh, it successful. You'll see here in this slide that there's a huge box. It's called uh, Donor Brains Unused Cabinet Size. Um, this is Bishop Casey, and here's the poor PAYE worker getting bled to keep Pinocchio alive uh, while we uh, 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 transplant them. Uh, there's a lot, an awful lot in this um, uh, 
poster caricature and somebody should really get a, a, a fully blown up one and put it on a wall in the hospital. Lastly, I have to say uh, very definitely that without Morris, uh, this would not have happened. Uh, probably without the, the two of us were necessary to support one another to make it happen, but certainly without his unique uh, abilities, it would not have happened. Um, would it have happened later on? Uh, well, certainly it would not have happened after uh, from 1987 onwards, because at that stage the two private hospitals were open. Uh, we weren't uh, restricted to just the matter in Crumlin. Our workload had virtually doubled from 300 cases to 600 cases, so it would not have been possible from 1987 onwards. I do believe uh, that in doing it the way we did it, um, it um, gave the matter um, a better reputation, it made it more attractive in many areas to come back to, uh, and it made it um, the only hospital that then could go on and do lung transplantation. Um, I think there's been a lot of benefits. Of course, it has placed a lot of demands on resources because the hospital and, and hospitals, I recognize, major hospitals are, have never been properly resourced uh, by the state. Uh, Thank you very much. Freddie, that's fantastic achievement. Any points? Lots of things to reflect on. Nori? Uh, well, sec uh, uh, repeat transplantation uh, it still isn't um, uh, particularly successful. Uh, a repeat transplant has a, oh, a one-year survival of around um, 45 to uh, 50 percent. So uh, if, if uh, Ronan uh, needed a primary transplant and I needed a second transplant, well, uh, Ronan's operation is going to carry an outcome of 90 to 95 percent uh, in the first 30 days. Mine in the first 30 days, if it's a congenital heart, or a repeat transplant is going to carry a mortality of 25 to 30 percent. So there's the real ethical issue of how how you use the the, the donor heart. Um, so he's always going to win. Um, so you mentioned congenital heart disease. Well, congenital heart disease, I believe, um, will all go down um, the implantable um, uh, artificial heart route, uh, something like the HeartMate 2, uh, which has proved very effective. Uh, as a destination therapy uh, rather than uh, just a bridge to bridge to transplant. Uh, from the point of view of xenographing, uh, Shumway very uh, appropriately years ago said, well, it's the future and always will be. Uh, there are huge issues with xenographs and pigs uh, in terms of uh, managing the rejection, uh, even with the development of the monoclonal uh, uh, antigens and things. Um, monoclonal antigens, while they're specific for a short time, their known unknowns uh, are, are just incredible. So the uh, incidence of solid organ cancer uh, using monoclonals will probably be higher than uh, the present immunosuppression. But it, it, was a hot, it, it was just at the right time. I mean, there was no divisions between anesthesia. Uh, Morris and I uh, were very skilled intensivists. There was just overwhelming support from uh, the theatre uh, nursing group, the intensive care, uh, the sisters, the board. It was just a, looking back at it, it was a unique period of time where um, as a whole group and in, institution, there was just a, an enormous can-do attitude. And while um, Morris and I were at the forefront of it, uh, we couldn't have done it without the attitude and support of everybody else. It was a real team affair. <laughs>